So I'm Dr. Nishant and this is my email ID, lkanta.57 at gmail.com. So if any one of you want the presentation or something like that, please feel free to contact me on that. Or even if you have any doubts, I'll be happy to clear them. So basically the definition of an inguinal hernia is an abnormal protrusion of an organ or a tissue through a defect in its surrounding walls. So if you have something in, inside a cavity and then it comes outside the cavity, we call that as a hernia. There are two different definitions. One is in Saviston, one is in Bailey. I've mentioned the both. At the end of the day, all you need to understand is what a hernia is. Now, before we go into the history taking part, you need to know that there are certain risk factors for development of an inguinal hernia. And majority or all of these risk factors have one thing in common, that is increased intra-abdominal pressure. Increased intra-abdominal pressure. So whenever there's an increase in the pressure inside the abdomen, it forces the contents outside and that's when you're gonna have a hernia. So chronic cough, so whenever the patient has a violent cough, we know that the abdominal muscles are accessory muscles of respiration. So whenever they contract, they are again increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, forcing the contents to come out. Same thing with chronic constipation, when you're using all your abdominal muscles to force and push the feces from the sigmoid and the descending colon to outside, again, you're causing increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. Now, this is something that you need to uh, understand, that is excessive straining during micturation. Now, all of you know about BPH, okay, which is benign prostatic hypertrophy. That is when the prostate is enlarged in size, they have difficulty in passing urine because the urethra, as we know, runs inside the prostate. So whenever there's an enlargement of the prostate, most of the times it enlarges inside. We call this in the median lobe, so which narrows the lumen and the patient or is or the elderly gentleman is forced to put pressure in order to evacuate or empty the bladder. Now, uh, another possibility for excessive straining during micturation can be urethral stricture. This is commonly seen in younger age groups. Okay, the stricture. So BPH is in old and stricture is seen in younger individuals. Now we need to understand in history, how do you differentiate between the two? Now the speciality with BPH is, it is also an angulation of the bladder. For example, if this is the prostate and the urethra runs inside this, the bladder is somewhat sitting like this. So whenever a patient puts pressure, this angle gets cut off. So what happens is the bladder becomes like this around the prostate. So the more pressure he puts, the less the urine comes out. All right, the quantity of urine which comes out is less because the urine gets dependent and this angulation gets cut off. Whereas in a stricture, if this is the prostate, the stricture is somewhere in the center. Okay, so the more he puts pressure, the more is the urine which comes out. So this is how you differentiate in history, uh, whether it's a uh, stricture or whether it's BPH. So ask the patient when you stream, is there improved stream? If there is an improvement in the stream, then it's a stricture. If there is a decrease, then it is a benign prostatic hypertrophy. Then obesity, they say that few studies say that obesity uh, is, uh, what is that? Uh, it reduces the risk of developing hernia, but most of the textbooks and most of the other literature and studies say that whenever the patient is obese, one, you're increasing the amount of fat in the abdomen. So it puts a strain on the muscle. Like for example, if this is his belly and these are his muscles. So this fat puts an excessive strain on the muscle. So the muscle becomes weak and also fat creeps in between the fibers of the muscle, making it weak and there increased risk of developing an inguinal hernia. Same thing with an intra, increased intra, uh, with a intra abdominal mass. If there is a mass inside of the abdomen, all of the other contents get pushed to one side, thereby increasing the pressure. The last is musculoskeletal disorders. We all know that they will have lack of collagen production or they will have some issue with the collagen synthesis. So again, they are at an increased risk. And the last one is smoking. Smoking can cause damage in two separate ways. One of it is obviously it involves your lungs. So it can cause bronchitis and that causes increase or excessive cough. 
and we know that this is a risk factor for developing hernia the other is it uh, decreases collagen production through elastase so when there is decreased collagen production and when there is increased elastase formation it again weakens the muscle okay so it acts by two mechanisms one is it acts on the lungs second is direct action on the um, production of the collagen or synthesis of collagen so classification you can classify it as external hernia and internal hernia so what do you mean by external hernia external hernia is basically where it comes from one cavity that is the abdominal cavity to the external surface okay when you can see the swelling outside bulge out then you call it as an external hernia internal hernia is from one compartment to another for example a diaphragmatic hernia okay you have the thoracic compartment on top and you have the abdominal compartment below so if you have something herniating from one compartment to the other we call that as an internal hernia so you can't see the bulge on the outside but it's on the inside now again external hernias can be classified into groin hernias anterior abdominal wall hernias pelvic hernias and posterior or the posterior wall hernias these are the lumbar hernias we'll not go into the details of this you just need to understand that there is a classification which exists for this and if it's an internal hernia we discussed about the diaphragmatic hernia the same way you have the hiatus hernia it is a form of diaphragmatic hernia where there is a protrusion of the fundus of the stomach into the thoracic cavity so even that is called as a internal hernia now coming to the topic proper groin hernia basically consists of both the inguinal and the femoral hernia okay now in inguinal we know we have the indirect and the direct and uh, for this you just need to understand a little bit of the anatomy this is the rectus abdominis muscle on both the sides and you have the linea alba in the center here you have the external iliac artery which is the main artery which goes and supplies the lower limb and the branch of the external iliac artery is the inferior epigastric artery okay and then we have the inguinal ligament coming like this all right so i'm i'm uh, i hope this is pretty straight forward we just draw the same thing on the other side as well we have the inferior epigastric artery and then you have the inguinal ligament sorry yeah and you have the inguinal ligament here so any hernia which comes out of this area that is in between the inferior epigastric artery and the rectus abdominis muscle this is also called as a hesselbach's triangle anything which comes out of this we call it as a direct hernia okay and anything which comes lateral to the inferior epigastric artery that is if it comes out from this area this is the deep ring if it comes out from here we call it as an indirect inguinal hernia okay so this will be the direct hernia on this side and anything which comes out lateral to the inferior epigastric artery you're going to have the indirect inguinal hernia this is the basic unless you understand this you'll not understand the tests okay we'll again look at the anatomy a little later now pathologically these hernias can be classified as reducible incarcerated irreducible incarcerated obstructed and strangulated it's pretty straightforward if this is the defect the gap in the center and you see the bowel protruding out okay this is the basic one when the patient lies down if this goes back inside completely if this hernia goes back inside completely we call this as a reducible hernia now even after lying down if this hernia doesn't go back inside it's still like that you call it as a irreducible hernia now coming to fourth one we'll talk about incarcerated later now if the patient coughs violently okay you will have a lot of intestine which comes out like this and it will get stuck a lot of it will come out the neck is narrow this is the neck so when that becomes narrow what will happen there is a compromise of the lumen okay this area will become narrow because it kind of gets blocked there so nothing is going inside so nothing is coming outside this is called as an obstructed hernia 
But at this point of time, please understand the blood supply, that is the mesenteric vessels, that it can still supply blood. Okay, it's only the food content which is not going inside. Okay, it's only the food which is not going inside and food which is not coming outside. This is called as obstructed. Now, if you allow this to go on for a little more time, eventually, even the blood supply will get cut off. Because of edema which develops, even the blood supply from here, so there is no longer any blood supply here. So this part will become dead, okay, gangrenous. This is what we call as a strangulated hernia at this point of time. Strangulated hernia, okay. Now coming to the last one or the incarcerated hernia. Most of you people have a doubt as to what exactly this is. It is a sort of obstructed inguinal hernia. Okay, you have a narrow neck. You have a loop of bowel which is gone in, which has come out. Now, what happens here is when the patient coughs, okay, and assume there is some amount of food particle here. Now, when he coughs, a lot of it comes out and it gets jammed here. The food or the content of the intestine itself gets jammed and causes obstruction. So this is solid, okay? So if it was liquid, so let's just make it in blue color. If this, was, if this was liquid, it will have enough space for the liquid to come out. So it is not a true obstruction. In true obstruction, even liquid can't come out. But here what has happened, a good amount of solid feces has gone and got stuck and that is unable to come out because the exit or the uh, exit has become very narrow here. Okay, so when the exit becomes narrow, good amount of solid feces is stuck there. So it will give you a sort of obstruction because now nothing is able to go in, nothing is able to come out. So it is a sort of obstructed hernia, but not a true obstruction. In true obstruction, even liquid can't go. Whereas in an incarcerated hernia, liquid can pass, but not in this condition because it is covered with solid feces. Now coming to history and uh, coming, let's start with the history. Obviously a chief complaint will be patient complaints of swelling in the right or left groin since how many days, months or years, this is pretty straightforward. Now coming to history of presenting illness, it has to be covered under four headings. One is regarding the swelling itself. When did it start? What was the duration for how long it's been there and progression? Was it small in size? Now has it become large in size? Was it relieve, reducing in size? Now it's no longer reducing in size. All this comes under the first point where you're talking about the swelling itself. Okay. Next is symptom suggestive of complications. Now we just read that the complications include strangulation, obstruction, and irreducibility. Okay. So what are the symptoms, the suggestive of complication? One is pain. Okay. It could indicate that it's an irreducible hernia. Vomiting. Then you can have constipation obstipation. Obstipation is where even flatus is not being passed. Okay. So these are symptoms suggestive of complication. So you have to ask all these to the patient. Next is symptoms suggestive of aggravating and relieving factors. So very simple. You have aggravating, then you have relieving factors. Aggravating factors, anything which increases the size, such as walking, uh, coughing, straining, lifting heavy weights. So if the swell, size of the swelling increases by doing all these, these are called as aggravating factors. Relieving factors, very simple. There are only two. One is on lying down, taking rest. Sorry, I think there are three. Taking rest. And the last point is the patient himself can reduce it in uh, by manual uh, manipulation. That is the word I was looking for, manipulation. Okay. So basically what happens, swelling has come out, there is pain, but when he forcefully pushes it inside, it's going back inside and the pain is relieving. So he'll be able to tell you that. So it tells you that it is almost becoming irreducible. That means it's in the process. It is somewhere between reducible and irreducible. It's not completely reducible, nor is it completely irreducible. It's somewhere in the gap between those two types. Precipitating factors we have already discussed such as chronic cough, constipation, straining at uh, urination, okay, difficult urination, 
these come under precipitating factors. So these are the things that you need to cover in your history. So for example, HOPI patient was apparently normal so many years back when he noticed a swelling in the right or left groin, initially of size three to three centimeters. Now this is very important. Do not make up um, what are metaphors like size of a lemon, size of a coin, size of a pea, all that. Tell, sir, the patient said this much. According to me, this is three centimeters. So I made it three to three centimeters. No one will fail you or dig into this. Okay. And then it gradually progressed in size to its present size of approximately. Now we have already seen it. So you can say roughly like 10 into 10 or 15 into 15 centimeters. Then you can also talk about progression in another way that it was initially only confined to the groin, but now it has gone into the scrotum. So you are telling that it is becoming bigger and bigger in size. So that's another way of communicating to the uh, examiner that is increasing in size. Next, regarding complications, no pain, no vomiting, no constipation. Okay. Now, swelling increases. These are the precipitating factors. Whether the swelling increases in size on coughing and straining, then the relieving factors, it, uh, it reduces on lying down or manipulation, or you can just say it does not reduce in size. That means you're trying to tell the examiner it's an irreducible hernia. So these are ways of communicating to them what you know and about the case per se. Now, past history, we are more worried about the comorbid conditions. Now, when I say comorbid conditions, obviously they are all diabetes, hypertension, asthma, okay, IHD. Now, why are we worried about all this? Obviously, diabetes and hypertension because they play a role during surgery. Asthma can cause cough. IHD, again, uh, anesthetic implications. When they're giving anesthesia, you need to know what is the ejection fraction, whether the patient can tolerate general anesthesia or whether the patient needs spinal anesthesia or local anesthesia. That information is got from this, but it will not help you in the diagnosis per se. Next, we're going to talk about family history. In family history, the only thing you need to know is whether there is any history of musculoskeletal disorders in the family. Now, coming to personal disease, this is pretty straightforward. You need to talk about diet, appetite, sleep, bowel and bladder habits. Obviously, here, when you're talking about this, you need to talk about the bowel, whether bowel habits regarding constipation. Even though you have mentioned it in HOPI, you have to repeat it here again. And again, bladder habits will become urinary stream. Whether there is poor urinary stream, whether there is difficult micturation, all that has to be uh, mentioned here. And when you are telling it, please don't tell it like a tabular column. Diet, good. Appetite, not reduced. Sleep, patient is sleeping well. Bowel, regular habit. Bladder, regular movements. No. Okay. Put it in a sentence form like this. He or she consumes a mixed diet. They have a and has a good appetite, her sleep is undisturbed and their bowel and bladder habits are regular. This is how you put it in a sentence form because it will make it a bit more classy. Now coming to examination. Now the first thing in the examination is the general physical examination. First is the build and nourishment. Build is basically the height. Nourishment is your weight or the way the patient is. Like you can say well, well nourished, undernourished, looking at the BMI roughly. Okay. Now Taller individuals, it's much easier to see the hernia. The more the height, the easy it is to see the hernia. Whenever they're short and stubby, the groin and all will be filled with fat. So it becomes difficult to see. So lower height, it becomes difficult to see the hernia. Okay. Now, nourishment. Again, when it's an undernourished or a very cachectic individual, again, here there are only bones. So you can see the hernia very fast. So they'll come to you at a very early stage. Okay, so underweight, they come to you at a very early stage. If they are overweight or obese, these people you can't see the hernia, okay, because they're already so fat. So even the groin is filled with the groin pad of fat, so you can't see the hernia. So they eventually come to you usually with complications, okay, either irreducible hernia or obstructed hernia. Because it's so fat, they don't realize they have a hernia, so they'll come to you only with complications. This is something that you need to keep in mind. Next, you need to talk about the other signs such as pallor, ictra, cyanosis, clubbing. Now, pallor, all these play a role in post-operative management, wound healing and stuff like that. But with regards to diagnosis, cyanosis and clubbing are important because they suggest to you some sort of respiratory or cardiac embarrassment. So when I say embarrassment, that means there is something wrong. 
So basically, if the patient is having chronic bronchitis, so they might have cyanosis and clubbing. And also, this means that there is less tissue oxygenation. Okay. One, they suggest you need to look for chronic bronchitis because basically they can have chronic cough. So you're looking at one extra sign of diagnosis. Chronic cough means because they can, it's a precipitating factor. Tissue oxygenation, you're more not about diagnosis, you're more worried about management, wound healing. If there is less tissue oxygenation, the wound healing will be delayed. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now coming to local examination, we know that we are supposed to do this like any other uh, swelling, inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. Percussion and auscultation have a slightly lower role. This in a hernia, palpation is more important. Okay, inspection also is, but palpation is more important because it will give you a clear cut diagnosis, whether it's direct, indirect, femoral and so on. That idea you're going to get on palpation. Now, in inspection, it's done both in standing and supine position. Some of you might ask, uh, like uh, this is commonly asked in the examination, why are you saying supine? It should always be standing because S thus says it is in standing position. Now, please understand for you to have, okay, before we get to that, so we, let's just talk about cough impulse. Now, for cough impulse, you need to, let's assume there's a hernia here, okay? For you to feel the impulse, you have to reduce the hernia, correct? The hernia should go back inside the abdomen. And then you're supposed to keep your finger here and ask the patient to cough. And only then when the comes out or when you can see the swelling, obviously, only then you're going to call it as a positive or an expansile cough impulse. So for you to reduce the swelling, at least you need to put the patient back into supine position. Please understand. Because when he's standing, it is one of an aggravating factor. So the hernia is already outside. So how are you going to look for expansile cough impulse? It's already expanded to its maximum limit. So you have to put him back into supine, reduce the swelling completely and ask him to cough. Or nowadays they say COVID times, don't ask him to cough. What is the alternative? You're going to ask him to do a Valsalva's maneuver. Close the nose, close the mouth, blow really hard that increases the intra-abdominal pressure and it might push out the content. So make the patient supine, ask him to do either the cough or the Valsalva's maneuver. And you should be able to see the bulge. If you can't see, after making him supine, make him stand up immediately and ask him to cough. You should be able to see the swelling or expand in size. That's the reason I'm telling you that the examination has to be in both standing and in supine position. It's equally important. Now this is this you're going to look uh, look at it like any other uh, swelling. You're going to talk about the site, the size, the shape, the extent, the borders, and the surface. So we'll not discuss much about this because it's like how you describe any other swelling. But what we are more bothered about is the shape of the swelling. Okay. So for this, let's go back and revisit the anatomy what we just learned regarding the Hasselbach triangle. Okay, we know that the rectus abdominis runs all the way from top to bottom on either side. Then you have the linea alba in the center. Then you have the inferior epigastric artery which goes like this on either side. So you're going to have the deep ring here and you're going to have the superficial ring here. Okay, this is the area of the inguinal hernia. So if it comes out from the Hesselbach's triangle, which is here, it's called as a direct hernia. If it comes from the deep ring, we call it as a indirect inguinal hernia. So I hope we have got this clear. So let's just see why we're talking about all these shapes. So we just enlarge or magnify that. This is the deep ring. This is the superficial ring. Okay. And this is your inguinal canal. Okay. This is your inguinal canal. And this is your inferior epigastric artery. So if it's a direct inguinal hernia, okay, let's just use a different crayon for this, probably green. Okay. So if it's a direct inguinal hernia, we know that it comes out from here. All right. That is the Hasselbach triangle. So when it comes out, this is how the swelling is going to look like. So it's globular. Okay. This is for a direct. 
Now the same thing, let's assume how the scenario is going to be for an indirecting vinyl hernia. This is the inferior epigastric artery. Now we have just discussed that for indirecting vinyl hernia, the hernia comes out from the deep ring. So it will come out like this and only then bulge. Okay. So can you see the shape? It is not exactly globular, it is somewhat like this. This is what we call pyriform shape. The shape is like this because it comes out through the inguinal canal. The direct inguinal hernia comes out only from a part of the inguinal canal. So it doesn't come out from the entire length. That's the reason it's globular in shape. Whereas an indirect is pyriform in shape, indirect. Okay, now next let's talk about the femoral hernia. So you have the deep ring, you have the superficial ring. This is the femoral, uh, sorry, the inguinal canal, and you know that the femoral hernia comes from here. That is beneath the inguinal ligament. Okay, there is this is the thigh. Okay, on both the sides, that is the leg. There is an important line which we call here. This is called as a Holden's line in the thigh. Okay, this is a Holden's line. This is a very thick line or a densely adherent fascia there, which doesn't allow the contents to go any further down. So what happens, the hernia which comes out of here can no longer go beyond this. Okay, It can't go beyond this. So what it does, it starts going back upwards. So this is how the swelling is going to look like. Okay, So the swelling is going to look like this. This is what we call a retort shape. And this is seen in a femoral hernia. So I hope you understand why we you have different shapes. So the reason I'm telling you all this is that in your examination, think about it before you talk. Okay. So you have a globular shape for a direct inguinal hernia. So don't say globular and diagnosis, give it as indirect hernia. This is the only reason why I've explained all this to you. If it's pyriform shape, this is for an indirect hernia. Okay. So don't confused or get confused between the two. So now you need to know about a few landmarks. This is extremely important for your examination point of view. First is the ASIS. Now how do you identify the ASIS? Let's just assume this is the abdomen. So you go to the flank that is this region. Okay, the flanks and just run your hand down. The first bony prominence you feel that will be the iliac crest. The height, height is called as iliac crest. Like that only you go anterior, you're going to find the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay, this is the ASIS. This is the umbilicus. From the umbilicus in the midline, you keep palpating down. The first bony landmark you're going to get is the pubic symphysis. Okay. From the pubic symphysis, you go laterally. This is the pubic symphysis. You go laterally, you're going to get a bony tubercle. This is the pubic tubercle. So pubic symphysis in the midline, pubic tubercle is lateral to it. So these are three landmarks that you need to understand before we talk about the next two, the most important ones, that is the deep ring and the superficial ring, because you need to know where these are located. So let's just enlarge them. We know that this is the iliac crest and at the tip is the ASIS. Here you have the pubic symphysis, this region, and you have the lateral most prominent part is the pubic tubercle. Okay. Now join a line from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle and exactly at the middle and just above it is where you're going to have the deep ring. Okay. And just above the pubic tubercle is the superficial ring. So very simple. So for you to understand all these tests, anatomy is extremely important. Go to the flank, reach the iliac crest, Go slightly anteriorly, the most prominent notch is the anterior superior iliac spine. From the midline, you go down, you're going to find the pubic symphysis, and from there, go laterally, you're going to find the pubic tubercle. So, at the midpoint between ASIS and pubic tubercle, pubic tubercle, at that point and slightly above it is where you're going to find the deep ring. Sorry, excuse me. And just above the tub pubic tubercle is where you're going to find the superficial inguinal ring. Okay. Now these tests are extremely important. And the second most important point is the shape of the deep ring. Shape of the deep ring is U shape. Okay. It's U shaped. Why is this important? I'll tell you. For example, for your deep ring test, the ring is like this. Whereas if you put your thumb here, 
and you ask the patient to cough, the hernia might escape from this side because you're not completely occluding the lumen. So when the ring is like this, your finger also should be horizontal, that is parallel to the inguinal ligament and only then compress the deep ring. That is when you'll be compressing this entire thing with your thumb. So the blue color is your thumb. Only then you'll be occluding the lumen completely. Okay. So the reason why I'm explaining all this anatomy is each of them have an importance when it comes to obstruction. So in palpation, the first thing that you're going to see obviously is temperature, tenderness, then you're going to confirm all your inspectory findings with regard to site, size, shape, extent, surface and stuff like that. Consistency, please, there are only three. There is soft, there is firm, there is hard. To be on the safer side, always just say it is soft. Okay? Don't go into this dovey consistency, elastic consistency. DAS does not explain any of this and neither are you. You can just say it is soft in consistency and they will let you go. If they ask you theory, you already know it. If it is dovey, it is supposed to be momentum. Okay? It's as simple as that. Or elastic. Okay? Now coming to the special test. So special test is what make up the crux of your hernia examination. First thing is getting about the swelling. I'm sure all of you know, but we'll just tell it to you again. This is the deep ring. This is a superficial ring. And this, this will be the scrotum beneath. Okay. So let's just take a case of indirect inguinal hernia, which has gone to the scrotum. And here, Let's just take a case of hydrocele. Okay, this is the deep ring, this is superficial ring. And inside the scrotum, this is where the swelling is. Now we know that the cord structures come from the deep ring, come out through the superficial ring, come down to the testis. Correct? Here also they come out to the deep, the superficial ring. And in hydrocele, we know that the testis is inside the sac, inside the hydrocele sac. Okay. So this is as simple as, as it gets. So this is a hernia. This is a hydrocele. Okay. So in other words, this is an inguinoscrotal swelling because it's coming from the groin to the scrotum. This is a purely scrotal swelling. So when you palpate here in this region, that is at the root of the scrotum or just beneath the pubic symphysis, when you go there and you palpate on both the sides, you can't palpate the cord structures separately. Whereas here, you can palpate, okay? Because you're above the level of the swelling and the swelling doesn't involve the cord structures. So if you can, that is why we call it getting above the swelling. If you can get above the swelling and feel the cord structures separately, we call it as a purely scrotal swelling. So don't say positive, negative. So when you're telling, you're supposed to say, we could get above the swelling or we could not get above the swelling. This is how the test is done. The patient you made standing and feel for it. If you feel this cord structures, then it's a scrotal swelling. If you don't feel the cord structures separately, then it becomes an inguinoscrotal swelling. Now there are prerequisites, certain prerequisites to do any of these tests. Okay. For any of these tests, the first and most important prerequisite is the swelling should be reducible. Okay. You cannot do these tests in an irreducible or even a partially reducible hernia. It has to be completely reducible. Only then can you do these tests. Otherwise, there's no point doing these tests. Okay. Why we look at it? Now, the second point for getting above the swelling is another important point is that the swelling should go into the scrotum. Only then you should even talk about this test. Now let's just assume it's a bibinocele. We know what a bibinocele is when the hernia is only within this much. Okay, it hasn't gone down to the scrotum. It's still in the inguinal canal. This is still a small hernia. There's no point doing getting above the swelling test here. Okay, this is the cord structures. So here, there's no point doing this test because the scrotum is normal. So it should be a inguinoscrotal swelling or the patient should have a scrotal swelling for you to do this test. The swelling must have entered into the scrotum for you to do this test. Otherwise, don't do it. Don't mention it also. That's e very equally important. Now, let's talk about each of these tests separately. First is the deep ring test. This is the deep ring. This is a superficial inguinal ring. This is your inguinal canal. 
this is your inferior epigastric artery this is the hesselbach triangle on top okay so when you occlude this horizontally we said you're going to occlude this horizontally with your thumb and if the patient first you reduce it completely we told you ask the patient to cough if you feel the impulse here then it's a indirect hernia it's pretty straightforward but in spite of occluding this if you see a hernia coming out and if you see a swelling appearing in spite of putting pressure in the deep ring it's pretty straightforward it's a direct hernia that means it's coming out from somewhere apart from the deep ring the only other place it can come out is from the hesselbach triangle so it becomes a di uh, direct inguinal hernia now again the catch to this some people say it, these tests should be done in standing position some people say supine das says standing but this one uh, place where i differ from him you're going to put the patient supine you're going to reduce the hernia then you're going to put your finger ask the patient to stand there's a chance your finger might slip so your, your finger what was supposed to be in the deep ring by the time he stands up your finger would have come off somewhere here even without you noticing it okay and the swelling might still appear so you will get a false positive test okay like the hernia is not there but you still think it's a direct hernia but in reality it will be a indirect hernia because the swelling would have come out from here and then appear like this from this area it would have come out okay so that's the reason we prefer to do it in a supine position that's about the deep ring test next you have the zeeman's test zeeman's test is you're going to have the saphenous opening here right so you have three fingers you're going to use your uh, index middle and the ring finger so the three finger now you're standing either next to the patient or behind the patient so for the right side you're going to use the right hand for the left side you're going to use the left hand okay stand in front or stand slightly behind the patient this is the patient stand next to him and use your fingers like this okay so three fingers one on the deep ring one on the superficial ring one on the femoral ring you know that this is the swelling ask the patient to cough again here also you can still do it in supine position keep your three fingers like this and ask the patient to cough if you find the impulse in the deep ring it is an indirect hernia if you find the impulse in the superficial ring because the hernia is coming out from the hesselbach triangle then it becomes a direct inguinal hernia instead if you find the impulse below the inguinal ligament it becomes a femoral hernia okay so pretty straight forward three fingers and don't say impulse felt at index finger impulse felt at middle finger impulse felt at ring finger you have to say the impulse is felt either at the deep ring the indirect ring or the femoral ring please specify it okay the last one is your finger invagination test again you have your deep ring like this you have the superficial inguinal ring this is the hernia and the scrotum is here okay with the test is inside now in this test you know it's not supposed to be done but i'll just teach it to you for theoretical importance please don't do this test in the exam okay you're going to use your little finger you're going to come to the side of the scrotum put your finger all the way up inside the scrotum sorry inside the inguinal canal and you're going to keep your finger like this inside either like this or like this doesn't matter ask the patient to cough if the hernia is coming out from here that is the deep ring the impulse will be felt at the tip of a little finger okay you've gone in like this he asks you cough tip of the finger is called as a uh, indirect inguinal hernia if it's a direct inguinal hernia so this is the uh, inferior epigastric artery so if it's a direct inguinal hernia we know that it comes from here that is the hesselbach triangle and then comes out to the superficial ring so now the impulse will be felt at the side of the little finger okay you put your finger in ask the patient to cough if it comes and hits you from this side or if you have turned your hand like this and it hits on this side doesn't matter you don't have to twist your hand like this they say that it should be on the nail the pulp and all rubbish you can just say it comes and hits from the side of the finger then it's a direct inguinal hernia it's as simple as that so the entire hernia examination is done on five fingers okay deep ring occlusion test you're going to use the thumb for the zeeman's test you're going to use these three fingers and for the finger invagination test you're going to use the little finger so it's done basically on five fingers okay and the last test that is a finger invagination test is not to be done two reasons one it's extremely painful second it's not going to give you any extra information whatsoever 
we already know whether it's a direct or indirect by doing the deep ring or by doing the Siemens test. So there's no point doing an extra test. Okay. So somebody asks you amongst these three, which is the most important? Just say deep ring because it's the simplest and immediately you'll get to know whether it's direct or indirect. And that's the end of your diagnosis. It's as simple as that. Okay. Percussion and auscultation, pretty straightforward. When you have a large swelling, if it is resonant and if you can hear vowel sounds, then it is a enterocele. Enterocele basically means intestinal contents. So let's just have a small chat about this omentoseal versus enterocele business. Now, in omentoseal, omentoseal basically it is omentum, okay, laden with fat. And you have an opening here. Now, because it is fat, it will slip through very fast. Okay, so the initial bit is fast. Initially, easy. Because it's fat, it can get adherent to the sac. So the last part where the additions are there will become difficult. Initially, easy. Later, difficult is omentoseal. So the same thing if it's an intestine. Okay, this is a loop of intestine and this is the opening because it is widely spread like this. Initially, it is difficult because it, it's slightly difficult to push it exactly into the place. So initially, if it is difficult, initially difficult, it is an enterocene. So once a part of the intestine goes in, okay, if one part goes inside the hole, the rest of it will just slip out. So later it becomes easy. Again, this is only for theoretical purpose and we'll go on to it. Like for example, when you have examined, okay, let, the, let's just understand the basic of hernia. Hernia is a hole through which the contestants, uh, sorry, the not contestants, sorry, the <laughs> contents, contents are coming from one cavity to another. You have no control over what content is coming out. Probably at one time when the patient strain, momentum has come out, then he's reduced it. And the next time when he coughs, intestine might come out. Okay. So when you are examining, it might be an enterocele and when the examiner is, uh, examiner is examining, it can it might become an omentoseal. You have no control over it. That is the first point. That's the reason I don't stress on these tests because they don't give you any extra information. Second point, if uh, whether it's an enterocele, whether it's an omentoseal, the treatment is still the same. It doesn't change. Okay, it doesn't make sense. Either way, you're going to go in for surgery. So it doesn't make sense. That's why we don't talk too much about enterocele and omentoseal and nowadays even examiners also agree to it but few of them might ask you for theoretical purpose and you are entitled to answer whatever points i just told you coming to systemic examination don't talk about everything you just need to know a few points one in abdomen you're only looking for mass or ascites why because both of these can cause increased intra-abdominal pressure it's as simple as that that is the only thing what you're going to look for and if it's an elderly gentleman, at least for postgraduates, that is for postgraduate students, they have to do a rectal examination, extremely important because you need to look for uh, prostatomegaly. And in the respiratory system, you're only going to look for features suggestive of chronic bronchitis. Again, because this can, this is one of the precipitating factors. And if you don't correct this, the patient has a higher chance of recurrence because he'll continue to cough even after your surgery. So the patient can have a recurrence. So coming to the diagnosis, there are six points that you need to say in a diagnosis. First is the side, okay, left or right. Next, what hernia it is, whether it is an inguinal or a femoral hernia. Next, what is a subtype? When I say subtype, it is either direct or indirect. Then is it complicated or not? Because you know it's a reducible hernia or an irreducible hernia. So complications, okay whether it's an uncomplicated or a complicated hernia. Next, whether it is complete or not. A complete hernia is one which reaches the base of the scrotum, not the root, all the way to the bottom of the scrotum. That is called as a complete hernia. And anything which doesn't reach the uh, base or the bottom of the scrotum, you call it as an incomplete. And the last and least important point is the content, whether it is an omentoseal or an enterocele. Practically in the real world, none of these matter, but for your exams, they do. And you need to 
tell it in the following format okay these are the six points that you need to cover when you're talking about the diagnosis so let's move on to investigations in investigations there are always three headings that you need to do first you need to confirm the diagnosis next you need to stage the disease next investigations which help in the treatment of the disease so if you put them under these three headings you'll be able to get most of your investigations so to confirm the diagnosis most of the times clinical examination is sufficient you don't need a investigation but if the examiner insists what else will you get the first answer is going to be usg abdomen because there are few things that you're going to look for in a usg first you're going to confirm okay you already felt it you're going to confirm second you're going to look for prostate underlying femoral hernia because you have examined the thing but femoral hernia because the opening is small you need to make sure there's no femoral hernia and opposite side opposite side okay either an occult or an undiagnosed hernia on the opposite side because there is a 10% chance that the patient can have a hernia on the opposite side as well and there's no role of staging here okay like when i say staging for example we had a case of ca breast staging means it can go to the bone it can go to the abdomen it can go to the chest they are going to get ct scan of the abdomen or ct scan of the chest or bone scan done that is what we call staging the disease here it's a non malignant condition so no role of staging directly for treatment for treatment what all blood tests you are going to do cbc rbs creatinine serum electrolytes if the patient is having obstruction that means if he is constantly vomiting the potassium might come down the patient can have hypokalemia so that is when you need to get a serum electrolytes done okay i missed out one point here regarding ct abdomen when do you do ct please understand ultrasound is a observer dependent investigation like uh, when i write the exam i'll get different marks when you write the exam you get different marks when somebody else write the exam they get different marks so it depends on the person who's doing the test if they are extremely good they can pick up even small hernias but sometimes hernias might get missed when a certain person is doing the investigation that is when ct comes into picture you have a doubt because the patient is giving you classic history swelling comes it reduces in size but when you are examining there's nothing there there's no cough impulse nothing you've made the patient stand you've made the patient strain you've made the patient walk and you still can't see a swelling but history is typical you have a strong doubt ultrasound says it's normal get a ct scan done a ct is a better or a more sensitive modality to pick up a hernia so you don't do it routinely in doubtful cases okay now patient says i have groin pain but no swelling so it might still be a small hernia in the initial stage which you have missed even the ultrasound might miss even you might miss on clinical diagnosis so get a ct scan so for a small or occult hernias you get a ct scan done moving to treatment according to me there is no role of conservative surgery that is because these hernias can go into complications any time that is the obstruction and the strangulation and these are extremely dangerous but there is one school of thought certain seniors might ask you this in the examination if it's an elderly gentleman who is not fit for anesthesia and he has a direct inguinal hernia we know that the chance of getting obstructed in a direct hernia is less because it is a globular shape whereas your indirect hernia and your femoral hernia have this kind of narrow area where it can get blocked or obstructed here there is no narrow area so they might say in an elderly gentleman who is not fit for surgery and who has a direct inguinal hernia you can conserve them you tell them it's okay just live with it you are anyway 90 years old so we don't want to put you through the risk of surgery don't get it done but what is the catch a study which was done in sweden showed that whether you are a professor whether you are assistant professor an intern or a student you can get the diagnosis wrong in 30% of cases okay even a professor who said it's a direct hernia on table it turned out to be an indirect hernia so 30% of the times you can be wrong that is why irrespective of what it is always advise surgery because the risk of complications is there so there are two surgeries one you have the open you have the laparoscopic now the advantage with laparoscopic it is done through small holes so the patient's recovery is faster whereas in open surgery you have a long cut so the recovery is slightly slow okay the pain is slightly more and the recovery is slightly slow and obviously cosmetically you have a big scar here you have a small scar there come into the disadvantages of laparoscopic surgery it has to be done under general anesthesia so the patient has some chest problem or cardiac problem they might not be the ideal candidates for doing it under general anesthesia 
whereas an open surgery can even be done under something as simple as local anesthesia as in where you just give injections there and there make only that area numb and operate and finish so it can be done under local spinal or general if the patient asks the patient says i have fear of needles don't prick me give me general anesthesia and this fit you can give ga even for open surgery there is no hard and fast rule that it has to be done under spinal okay so in laparoscopic surgery you have early recovery but the disadvantage is that it has um that you need to do it under uh, general anesthesia second point or another point in favor of laparoscopic surgery the through the same holes you can operate both the sides because you're in the midline and you're seeing both the sides whereas in open surgery you need two separate cuts so for bilateral hernias laparoscopy is a ideal choice because the three small holes rather than two big cuts second in recurrence if you have done a hernia open hernia repair and there is a recurrence go through the opposite route okay through, so for like through laparoscopic route because there the mesh will be there and lot of adhesions and the anatomy will be spoiled so there is a chance you can damage the inferior epigastric artery by doing something so at that point of time go laparoscopic and vice versa if you have a recurrence in laparoscopic route do the open surgery in open surgery recurrence do laparoscopic surgery so there are various surgeries you have the herniotomy or the hernioplasty and the hernioplasty very simple so for us before we understand herniotomy you need to understand what condition it's done in childhood the deep ring and the superficial inguinal ring both lie one on top of the other okay as age progresses they become far apart like this this is called as obliquity of the canal it becomes oblique as age progresses so in a young child if he has a hernia that means something is coming out of here directly like this all you have to do is cut the sac don't do anything else because as age progresses it will become this and he would have developed a natural defense mechanism that is when you are going to do herniotomy okay where it is done in young patients next hernia raffi is where you are going to use muscles okay like for example deep ring superficial ring you have the conjoint tendon on top and one ligament at the bottom there is a defect there you need to close it so you bring the conjoint tendon and suture it to the inguinal ligament and you obliterate the inguinal canal okay where you are going to use muscles or tissue okay the other word for this is a tissue repair okay when you are going to use a tissue repair we call this is a hernia raffi okay so the examples for these will be your bessonis shoulders and something as recently as desarda okay and the last one is a hernioplastic hernioplasty is where you are going to use a mesh an implant or a prosthesis this acts by the mechanism called as aseptic inflammation so how this acts you have a deep ring you have a superficial ring you have a hole and you're going to put a mesh on top of this okay like this mesh so what happens the mesh will have holes in it right so it allow fibroblasts to grow through these holes it's an inflammatory process and then it becomes hard okay there is ingrowth of fibroblasts into the mesh and the mesh becomes a, like a solid barrier at that point of time this process is called as aseptic inflammation there is inflammation that's the reason fibrosis is there but it is not septic septic means secondary to infection here there is no infection there is only a foreign body reaction that's why it's called as aseptic inflammation that is called as hernioplasty this is just for your knowledge because they do keep asking you this what are the types of laparoscopic surgery you have tap and tap sorry tap is got cut off there tap and tap tap stands for totally extra peritoneal repair tap stands for trans abdominal pre peritoneal now let's just see why it's called so please understand in both the methods the mesh is put just behind the fascia transversalis we know that the defect or the direct hole is in the fascia transversalis right so this green line here what you're seeing okay i'll just color this out again this green line is a fascia transversalis so your mesh has to sit just behind that and behind that is your peritoneum okay 
this is the peritoneum okay so you have a defect in the facial transvalus and then you have the peritoneum so the mesh is kept in between these two in between the facial transvalus and the peritoneum now there are two ways of accessing this one you go in between these two from the beginning only from the beginning only go between these two areas go on separating them slowly go to that area put a mesh come back this is called as totally extra peritoneal because you are outside the peritoneum you haven't gone inside the peritoneum you are outside the peritoneum you are between the peritoneum and the fascia transversalis in this the next one is trans abdomen here what you are going to do you are going to pierce the peritoneum like how we do any other surgery for gall bladder or appendix you are going to pierce the peritoneum go in then come back here cut the peritoneum put the mesh suture the peritoneum back so please understand in both these surgeries the mesh is in the same plane between the fascia transversalis and the peritoneum here in one you are going in between the peritoneum and fascia transversalis in the other one you are going inside the abdomen then opening the peritoneum putting a mesh then closing the peritoneum now somebody might ask why are you going through this first of all you are going through peritoneum and then coming back why are you doing this that is because it is easier to do because here you have lot of space between the intestine and the peritoneum there is lot of space whereas here the space is very less so you are working in a very narrow area so you don't know what all structures you can damage so this is slightly more difficult to do okay so choose the easier route and not the difficult route so that is the difference between tap and tep so in terms of recurrence outcome and all they are the same tap is easier to do because you are going inside the peritoneal cavity where you have a lot of space in tep there is very little space because from here you have to go on dissecting here you are coming here just dissecting this one area where i have put a circle only this one area you are dissecting putting a mesh closing it and coming out here you have to dissect this entire space before you come to the base okay so i'll stop sharing my screen now so if there are any doubts or questions i'll be happy to take them there's one question on the chat box where akshay yes segde has asked what do you mean by closed loop obstruction a closed loop obstruction is nothing but a valvulus okay this is an open loop where you have one loop entering one loop going out you have an afferent and an efferent limb in a valvulus the loop is closed okay you have nothing entering nothing going out but what will happen is when it is twisted like this there is nothing coming in nothing going out but the segment of intestine which is caught in that loop can still secrete mucus okay it will go on secreting mucus this will go on distending so you have an obstruction but secondary to a uh, valvulus so wherever the loop is closed we call it as a closed loop obstruction need not be valvulus it can even be a band like you have some loop of intestine like this and the band is sitting exactly when one loop is cut off only that one loop is cut off we call it as a closed loop obstruction any other doubts or questions yes sir in youtube yes uh, please subhasri saw have doubt how nocturia is important in history of presenting illness yes if the patient is having prostate megaly nocturia is an other uh, way of eliciting history Uh, basically they are unable to co completely evacuate their bladder before they go to sleep because he continues to put pressure in bph he is unable to evacuate he goes to sleep again in about 2 or 3 hours the bladder will distend and he gets a sensation to get up to pass urine again he will again get up and come so that is another point that you can ask and uh, if the patient has nocturia of 2 to 3 times or 3 to 4 times that means this patient has prostate megaly that is one point and the second thing is it might play a role in the post op period where the patient can have urinary retention okay nocturia is an indirect indicator of prostate megaly and patients with prostate megaly have a higher chance of developing urinary retention in the post operative period so you need to keep them ex, uh, or uh, keep them aware of this otherwise you'll say i came for hernia surgery i'm ending up with the bladder or urinary issues so you'll think it's a complication so keep them informed beforehand another one from her uh, if intestine is adherent to sac 
then the later part will be also be difficult yes sir. yes i completely agree with you but at that point of time it will be an irreducible hernia there are additions you can never reduce the hernia in the first place so it's an irreducible hernia and we have already discussed all these tests omento seal entro seal what all these tests are only dependent on reducible hernias and uh, it can be difficult i'm not saying no that's the reason i said these tests are very unreliable as long as you know it's a hernia as long as you know whether it's direct or indirect that's more than enough the contents can change like i said with it's a hole you have no control as to what comes out and what goes in that's why i told you it's only for theoretical purpose yeah next question other from her uh, please tell about tenor slides tenor slides tenor slide okay i'll need to share my screen again for that just give me a second so we discuss this is the deep ring this is a superficial ring and we discuss saying this is the conjoint tendon and this will be the inguinal ligament okay so that's the conjoint tendon and inguinal ligament and we discuss that when you're doing a hernia or raphi okay that is a tissue repair you want to bring down the conjoint tendon here like this okay and you want to obliterate this space certain times you might not be able to bring it down because it's under a lot of tension okay the defect is there it might be a congenital defect it may not be muscular weakness but you can't pull it down any further that is when you make certain relaxing incisions on top okay make little incisions which allow the sheath to come down you know the conjoint tendon is made up of two muscles the internal and the uh, transversalis abdominis transversus abdominis muscle so make thin incisions which allow it to come down okay it slip down and it will help bring the conjoint tendon down and you can do a tension free repair that should be the point this is something like a very toxic relationship somebody wants to get away but you are clinging on to them it will never work at some point of time it will break down and have a break up so they say you no know, if you allow something let it go so it should be tension free if they allow you they'll come back same thing like here also if there is a lot of tension it the sutures will give way so whenever you have a when you are trying to suture under tension that is when you are going to use tanner slide those relaxing incisions in order to help uh, get those two uh, in approximation anything else and last one sir hmm. in tap uh, tapp opening through which we can go intraperitoneally why is the why is that opening not used to cut peritoneum by two separate incision and like i said see the opening for laparoscopic surgery you need to understand basics you need to work far away from your hand it's like cricket okay in cricket you have a long bat and please understand even in that when you're hitting the six it will be from the lower half of the bat not from the upper half so the farther it is you have more control more action more space to work the same thing in cricket try to hit it with a small table tennis racket you can't get, generate so much power okay your movements are restricted same thing in tapp i'll just erase all this and okay so here we entering from here now we have long levers okay we have a lot of space to work in this area a lot of room in order to work now the same thing if we make the hole here only directly okay if we make the hole here right at the place where we are trying to cut and try to work here it's a very congested area where you can't work you can't spread the mesh nicely so it's more of a technical challenge i know it sounds a bit complex but once you understand basics of laparoscopic surgery it becomes easier for you to understand so i hope you understand the relationship by trying to hit a cricket ball with a bat as against trying to hit it with a table tennis racket the more longer it is the the instrument the more easier it is for you to work or more freedom you have the farther away you are from it 
sir uh, another one what is component separation technique so oh, that is not for inguinal hernia that is for uh, ventral hernia we'll anyway cover it because we're asking questions this is the abdomen let's assume there is a big hole here in the umbilical region secondary to whatever it is now you are trying to pull this to the center and stitch it we just discussed like for a conjoint tendon under tension and you are unable to do it okay so you do what we call as component separation you have now let's just look at the transverse section this is the rectus abdominis and you have three muscles on top right you have the external oblique you have the internal oblique and you have the transverse abdominis so here this is the normal one so now let's look at an abnormal condition the three holes are there the muscle is here then you have a big gaping defect and you have the muscle on the opposite side with the three uh, fascias or the upper neurosis which are covering the muscle so you are unable to pull it in the center so this is exactly like a tanner slide we are going to cut one here one here so it will become a bit more loose and you are able to get this to the midline and suture it and then put a mesh over here that is what we call as component separation so if you cut anteriorly that is external oblique it is called as anterior component separation if you cut it posteriorly it is called as posterior component separation that means the transverse abdominis